So, my name is Seth Price. Um, my background is both ecology and computer science. Um, I'm technically still working on a PhD in ecology at Utah, um, but I work in San Francisco now. Um, my like one sentence of what I do is I write pro programs that process satellite data, which is like scientific computing. Um, my background, uh, my PhD program, in fact, is land cover classification. Uh, another big project that I've worked on is uh, deforestation detection. Um, and, and in addition to that, using my more computer science-y background, I've also done more GPU computing uh, and artificial intelligence type work. Uh, and I've been working at Plant now for uh, a little over two and a half years, I think. Um, and so at Planet, uh, there's been a couple talks on Planet uh, so far at this conference. Hopefully you guys are, uh, have seen at least one of those and you're familiar with them. Um, but our kind of, our mission one is to image everywhere, every day, and to be able to provide it to everybody. And in order to do that, we're going to need hundreds of satellites. Uh, right now, each one has like an 11 megapixel camera. That means a uh, 10 by 15 kilometer view area, three to, three, uh, three to five meter resolution. Um, and we're kind of doing this agile aerospace, uh, where I'm not the hardware engineer, but if I was our hardware engineer, this talk would be about how um, Things are very traditional and very careful in aerospace, and we aren't. Um, so we move fast and break things in space, which is a lot of fun. Um, and it's not like the movie Gravity. Um, so in order to kind of fill these requirements, uh, I was tasked with being able to automatically ortho-rectify around a million images a day. Um, this talk is uh, kind of how we have put together a system for doing that. Uh, these are some pictures of our satellites uh, to get you, give you an idea of uh, what we're talking about. They're each about this big. Um, these, at, uh, the top image is the satellites in our dove nest uh, on the ground in San Francisco. And they are, like on the bottom here is them being launched out of the International Space Station, uh, the world's largest artificial satellite launching some of the world's smallest satellites. Um, and so right now we're just kind of starting with some ba very basic hardware, um, just RGB. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what is our initial strength with um, hundreds of RGB satellites? It's uh, time series analysis. And uh, with my background in time series, or in my, with my background more like image processing data analysis, uh, I knew that our images really needed to be correctly rectified through time so that there weren't like trees jumping around on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, that kind of makes things difficult to and very frustrating to try to process. Um, and so I need to create a system with the best uh, possible spatial precision uh, and accuracy is good but uh, precision is actually the most important so it always images always stay in the same place. Um, and I'm not going to get anything like any advantages from this hardware, from this bare bones hardware. And I need to be able to process a million images a day. And so as far as I know, these uh, requirements are fairly unique. Uh, it's not like there's an active open source community for uh, geo-referencing uh, geo and processing a million images a day. Um, and so I started with inspiration a couple years ago when I started working on this with, uh, from actually a, a Google Summer of Code 2002 project, or 2012 project, uh, called GDAL Correlator um, that uses uh, the SURF algorithm to find uh, feature points and match feature points between images. Um, before that, kind of my initial thought was, all right, well, maybe there's some sort of uh, gradient descent approach that we could use to slowly line up images. But that would just require too many passes through the data. And I knew in order to do things, um, align things right kind of the first time, uh, I would actually need to um, just come up with a whole bunch of tie points and match them into place. Uh, and I also started with a GRASS GIS module. Um, my background is actually writing GIS modules for my PhD work and uh, actually also for my personal business uh, that do very fast uh, image processing and uh, like on the GPU in C at a very low level. Um, and it also give me, the, so it's fast because it's in C, it also would give me ability to um, do 
more easily like vector and raster handling and all it take care of all of that those basic uh, geo referencing uh, problems people normally have or people can have um, and then also I can do further analysis in the same environment so for atmospheric correction I can just run the i dot core module afterwards and boom there's your uh, success atmospheric correction uh, and I can also do really fast prototyping of uh, differencing images and things like that in uh, r dot map calc and so anyway the grass GIS environment uh, is very useful for uh, for uh, getting some prototyping done fast um, oh yeah and so the satellites I was told would um, have an initial spatial error of one to two hundred meters um, so we launched the flock of them and we realized that we actually had some hardware issues and our spatial error was closer to about 100 kilometers. <laughs> um, and so I was then tasked with fixing that also. Um, and so this is what the kind of imagery that we're talking about. This is, I believe, one of our first light images from, one, from our first satellite. It the first. Okay, it is the first light image. It's a nice first light image. Um, and so you can see individual trees, um, and, but then you can also see the landscape. You can recognize features in the last landscape that you might be able to also match uh, against Landsat 8, um, which is where I'm going with this. Um, so kind of an underlying, uh, underlying principles between how, uh, for how do we rectify something. Uh, and at the highest quality, we need to, um, let's see, so every time you resample an image, or every time you reprocess the image, rotate the image, resize the image, you're going to lose some image quality because uh, you're just kind of resampling between pixels and you're averaging pixels. And so we want to go from finished product, or from raw image to finished product in as few resampling steps as possible. So in the program, or in the module that I wrote, it actually goes directly from beta masking to the end product and it doesn't do any intermediate resampling steps, uh, which is a big thing because um, in order to use a lot of third-party utilities, I would need to first de mask it and then feed it through another utility and then maybe say orthorectify it. Um, but I wanted to do it all, in, all at once in order to get best, uh, best resolution. Um, and we also have another problem that we have an unknown initial location, which means we don't actually know what the image looks like at first, um, because the topography is going to really warp images a little bit one way, depending on uh, whether you're looking at a mountain from this angle or you're looking at, or you're looking at a different mountain. Uh, you need to line things up with the DEM and line things up with the base map at the same time. And so that'll require some sort of initial uh, iterative refinement. And in order to actually make it useful on our system, it needs to be very fast. It needs to be parallelizable at the large scale. It can't rely on like communicating with the next and previous scenes in the strip. Um, and it needs to be parallelizable internally um, in order to say run on uh, SSC or run on uh, OpenCL, on, run a, uh, on the GPU. Um, so kind of the initial, or the, the stack that we're talking about, uh, error that we need to correct for when we download an image is uh, kind of from the sensor down to the ground is we have bare masking. Frank talked about this a little bit. And I'll talk about these, each of these a lot more in depth um, after this slide, but just to kind of go, give an overview of what we're talking about. Um, bare masking, then we need to correct for uh, telescope geometry like the optics. We need to correct for the orbital geometry. So how do we take the image and project it over the sphere of the Earth or the oblate spheroid of the Earth. Um, and we have the satellite pointing accuracy. This is where we start getting into some real, real error um, that we can't control in the program itself. And we have uh, topography. So how do we correct for um, like the landforms if uh, the tops of the mountains are warped one way and the valleys are warped another way in the images. Um, and so like I sort of mentioned, we can calculate the first three with a rigorous model um, in theory on the satellite. And we can say, all right, well, we know the satellite has these characteristics. But um, the last two, we really don't know. We, we, we don't know how they're affecting the image. We, um, and so we need to kind of iterate in order to get things right. Um, and we also need to actually, in order to 
sample, we need to sample backwards from the ground. We're saying, all right, what's this pixel location? Or we know a pixel location on the ground. And so we want to go backwards and say, all right, well, where is this ground location correspond to the pixel location on the sensor? Um, and it might actually be, say, between pixels on the sensor. Um, but in order to make sure that we have every pixel filled out on the ground, we need to go kind of backwards uh, from the ground to the sensor in our calculations. So going into a little bit more detail, demosaicing, Frank mentioned this. Um, we probably pulled the same Wikipedia graphic. Um, let's see, you start with a raw image. It's bare masked. It has uh, blue, green, red, green. Um, and it's actually, doing the demosaicing is a little bit more difficult than simple, simple bilinear interpolation between the colors, uh, which should, if you're familiar with image processing, that's kind of your first guess. Um, because high frequencies, lines and sharp edges, uh, end up getting, end up being um, adjusted or interpolated differently. And so you end up with a very colorful edge or very colorful line. And so you need, need to be able to correct for that. Uh, I found a paper that from 2004, high quality linear interpolation for demosaicing of bare, bare patterned color images. Uh, I think it was actually out of Microsoft. Um, that kind of seems to be the standard easy way of doing it. Um, and so I've been using that method. It's very parallelizable. Uh, so we have that going for us. There's another paper that talks about how to, uh, uh, the best set of vector instructions on the processor, uh, if there's any low, low level, low, low level people here. Um, and so I was excited to see how, uh, ha how fast it could run. Um, optical correction we actually found with our telescope that it was really inconsequential. It was only uh, around the, on the order of one pixel, the, the warping that uh, our telescope produced. And so we decided not to worry about it. Um, it was much more important to just figure out where, like get the first 100 kilometers right and worry about the second, you know, the last one meter or two meters later. Um, orbital correction. I actually use Proj4 library for this. Um, it has a projection called tilted perspective, um, which is basically what you would see from orbit. And so tilted perspective just says, all right, if you take your sensor plane, you tilt, tilt it this way and you have it at this orientation, uh, this is how you project on the uh, Earth sphere. Earth's spheroid. Um, and then, of course, being Proj4, we can just plug our uh, coordinates, our input coordinates in, in UTM, and kind of work with them in both directions as needed. Um, and yeah, Proj4 is great like that. A whole bunch of trig I don't need to worry about. Um, this is quite nice. Um, Georectification. This is probably the most uh, technical and difficult aspect of this. It's very difficult to figure out um, where, where you're looking, um, especially if you're looking like 100 kilometers away and the seasons have changed and you're at a different resolution. And it's a different time of year, different time of day. Um, and so normally this is a very human intensive process where you have, say, a room full of people clicking out tie points between images and saying, all right, well, this is the same bush between these two images. I'm going to line them up on these Im image, uh, line them up, and then do some sort of like rubber sheeting or something like that. Um, it's, I'm treating it as a three-step process. Uh, the first part is area search, which takes care of this um, kind of hardware, some hardware issues that we have, and it gets us down to within, say, uh, a few hundred meters, uh, one kilometer. Um, PL rectify, which does the actual rectification of, uh, say, one to three kilometers down to uh, whatever uh, base map you're using. In my case, it's actually uh, Landsat 8, a stack of Landsat 8 images. And then kind of as it's available, we also do some uh, OSM snapping, so open street map snapping. I look for lines. I start extracting lines from the imagery, and I use an algorithm called mutual information to uh, find the best match. I'll get to that later. Um, and so Landsat 8, a lot of automatic tie points um, to be continued. And so the next layer down, then, in this, what, how we're rectifying is orthorectification. And so at this point, we think we know where the image belongs. And so we'll use Proj4 again to calculate all of the angles um, between the mountains and the satellite, or between the surface of the Earth and the satellite in XYZ 
space. Um, and just kind of do some, let it do the complicated trig of Earth's oblate spheroid type stuff that I'm happy not knowing about. Um, and then just do the simple trig of, all right, so we're looking at this, ang this mountain at this angle, and therefore it's kind of moved over by this amount. Because um, we have the, um, the SRTM 90 meter uh, data set provided by SIGAR, uh, I forget the acronym is, but um, they've done a lot of gap filling and uh, refinement of the data set. Um, and we're also adjusting to the average control point elevation because, um, so we have the image tied down at this point in the, uh, in the stack, but we've tied it down to the average, some average elevation. And so in order to do a good orthorectification, then we need to orthorectify relative to that elevation. All right. And so getting actually further into a little bit more detail about um, auto geo rectification and how do you actually rectify the planet um, and how do you do it automatically, how do you uh, work with these computer vision algorithms. Um, I thought this was a cool example. This is actually just a random scene from uh, last week, I think, that we pulled down. Snowy scene in China. Um, in the background is map box imagery, which is generally rectified pretty well. And in the foreground is our scene that we imaged. And you can see that roads are lining up pretty well, um, along with the rest of the city and the fields. And it's a snowy scene, um, and there isn't much detail in it, but still rectified pretty well. Um, let's see. So in a little bit more depth of, as to how the computer vision part of this works, um, we use something called automatic uh, or key point dis detection and description algorithms from OpenCV. This is, if you've heard of SURF or SIFT, um, algorithms like that, these are similar, or SURF or SIFT are actually key point detection description algorithms. Uh, they were kind of the original ones. Since then, there's actually been a lot of work. There's a lot of free, um, free. There's a lot of papers available. There's a lot of uh, very good, but even faster, key point description algorithms available. We're using um, the descriptor or the detection algorithm STAR, which is basically is looking around the image for corners. It'll find say. 50,000 interesting points and it says, hey, this point has something interesting to say about it at this scale. And then it passes it to the uh, description algorithm. We're using the algorithm called FREAK, uh, which stands for fast retina key points. Um, and that takes that point and turns into some sort of like math mathematical description. And the mathematical description says, hey, this key point looks like this and where this is like some sort of number or set of numbers, where if the numbers are close, then, or it, so if the numbers between two of these key point descriptors are close, then you're looking at two very similar points. And if they're uh, different from each other, or if the sets of, set of numbers is different than each other in this vector, this descriptor, um, then you're at probably looking at different things. Um, and so both of these are actually intended for uh, like video work. Um, they're very fast, they're fairly simple. Uh, they produce 50,000 points per say 10 by 10 kilometer patch of land. Um, and oh yeah, I like my philosophy with generating uh, and matching key points is that uh, 10,000 matching key points can't be wrong. Um, we're, we're producing a lot of matches, a million matches uh, or a million rectified images it's hard to do that right 100% of the time, but if you have 10,000 matching tie points in your images that have been automatically generated, um, yeah, it's hard to screw that up. All right, a little bit more depth on point descriptors. What are they? Um, they're actually just a string of bits. So we have a 512-bit vector, and each bit is, um, looking at this little sub area in around this key point saying, all right, is this little sub area brighter or dimmer than the one next or than this other sub area next to it? And it does that 512 times. And for each comparison, it generates a, a bit um, in the 512 bit vector. 
And so it's very information dense. It's sensitive to rotation, it's sensitive to scale. Um, and that actually works to our advantage because then we're all, we always know that we're comparing, since we're in orbit, we kind of already know our rotation and we already know about how big the image should be. And so, uh, and so we always know that we're kind of comparing apples to apples. Um, let's see, yeah. And so when we have two of these descriptors, we take what's called the Hamming distance um, in order to find how similar the bit vectors are. And if we have something with a very small distance between them, we say, all right, well, these two points are very similar to each other. All right, so that's a little bit of background on um, the points themselves or the descriptors themselves. How to, we need to turn that, in order to rectify the world, we need to be able to put them in a manageable format. We need to be able to pull them up on the fly and use them quickly on the fly. Um, in order to do that, we compile them ahead of time into index tiles. Um, let's see, so we download Landsat 8 data, or Frank downloads Landsat 8 data. I pull it out, and I say, all right, so for this area, we have a stack of um, Landsat 8 has been around for a year and a half now, uh, approaching two years. Um, and we, so we have a stack of all of this data, or all, all of these images, and we can take any number of them, extract all of the feature points from them in this area, and from around, from like year round. So we take um, summer tie points and we mix them together with um, uh, winter tie points and um, like seasonal variations during the growing season in farmlands, uh, where different far different fields will be brighter and dimmer depending on the time of year. Um, See. And we mix them all together into a single index file where we use the open source library FLAN, which stands for Fast Library for Approximate Nearest Neighbors. And so, and we save this FLAN index. Um, all right. And so we have the clouds mask out, masked out also. Um, so we've removed all of the a lot of extraneous tie points. We're only looking at things in the ground. And we also have a fairly high spatial accuracy from Landsat. Uh, there was actually a paper re released recently. Uh, the Landsat technical step spec puts the spatial accuracy at, um, or the horizontal accuracy of Landsat at about 65 meters. Um, but in operation, they, have, they are aligning their panchromatic band to closer to around 18 meters around the globe according to this paper. So each index tile ends up having up to around 10 million point descriptors on a tile. But because of this, because of this FLAN library, that the fast part, a fast um, approximate nearest neighbor, uh, we can take 50,000 points that we've pulled out of our satellite image with point descriptors and we can query them into an index of 10 million points that we've generated from year-round, uh, like from year-round Landsat data. And we can say, all right, for each of these points on the satellite image, here are the 10 or 20 best matching points uh, in land from Landsat. Um, oh yeah, and I also uh, pa uh, contributed a patch back to FLAN to LZ4 compress. Um, the index tiles to make them much smaller because we're dealing with terabytes of uh, index data. Uh, and it also increases the IO speed, having to deal with small, the index files tend to be around 100 to two or 300 megabytes in size. Um, okay, so at this point we have say 50,000, maybe even 100,000 matches because uh, each point can match multiple Landsat eight points. Um, and things ch change over the year. So a there's a lot of noise in the data, or a lot of noise in the key point matches. Uh, I've put a lot of effort into trying to eliminate that noise. Uh, so 100 to say 150 of those 512 bits can actually be um, mismatched. Um, so just randomly, it, or if you have two random vectors, on average, you're gonna have 512, or five, you're gonna have 256 of 512 non-matching. And so we're actually a good chunk of the way there, but on, 
ever is we can still get useful data with, uh, or useful key point matches with around 150 mismatched points uh, between the two point descriptors, or mismatched bits between the point descriptors. But we need to apply a couple algorithms to, um, uh, to remove these bad point matches. Uh, and then we, le we actually rely on um, OpenCV a little bit more using something called, uh, I think it's the find homography function, uh, which uses RANSEC, which uses a function called RANSEC, which was developed in the 80s, I believe. It stands for Random, con uh, Random Sample Consensus. And what it does is it actually takes out a random set of point matches. It looks for, it, it tries to find, uh, compute a transformation function using those points. And that sees how well that function explains the rest of the data in the set. And it does this randomly over and over again. So for 10, 100, uh, maybe even 1,000 times looking for the best set of points and the best set of inliers uh, that, it can use to uh, that it can use to explain the whole data set. And so it does this over and over again. And it actually produces a, does a pretty good job. Um, and it can work with data sets that half of the matches are bad. Um, and this works really well for rectification. But when, you have, when you're matching over 100 kilometers, it's actually, you end up with even more noise in your data set. Uh, say you're trying to rectify images in Iowa or in Nebraska, and you, know, you just have all of these cornfields, and one intersection, one intersection between roads looks like another intersection between roads and farmland. Um, it's very difficult to find, to lock down exactly which fields are correct in these images. And so I developed new, another algorithm called pair pair that I'm not going to get into too much. Um, but it's used to, um, it assumes that a set of point pairs, a set of matching key point pairs, uh, shouldn't be rotating or scaling relative to each other. And if they do, then therefore one of them, or at least one of them, isn't the key point that you're looking for. And it actually works with up to 95% error in your key point matching data set. Um, let's see. So area search. Area search is, does this initial match where it um, is trying to th get things kind of under control or down to a, a few hundred meters, uh, maybe a few kilometers. Because rectification, uh, the rectification program only actually works it up to three kilometers. It was designed for um, say, one to 200 meters, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and so we need to actually get our imagery figured out um, down to that. Yeah, and also, instead of indexing the whole globe at a time, we're flipping through each index tile and saying, all right, well, does this index tile, does it look like it has some sort of match to, um, to, this, Im or to this image, to the satellite image? And we go through each image tile, or Im image tile in our area, and so we can do this for hundreds of uh, tiles in whatever area we happen to be looking across, depending on whether the satellite people are like, oh, hey, well, this satellite was pointing off in this general direction. Um, and it will tell us which tiles are more likely to be matched and kind of where the match is likely to be. Uh, and also, if we are unsure of the satellite rotation, we can start searching at multiple uh, rotations. Um, just because the key points are accurate, the descriptors stay the same within about plus or minus 10 degrees. Um, but after that, they become completely different or, and are not matchable anymore. Um, all right, so what we do with all of these tie points is we turn it into just a simple linear equation. Um, this is probably the simplest part of this whole rectification process or auto rectification process is, is turns into a simple linear equation of just six coefficients of how do we want to actually transform the image in order to produce something that aligns on the ground uh, with what's actually there. And so we use OpenCV again to, uh, just with the solve function in OpenCV, to, uh, to compute, to solve this system of linear equations. And I found that Surprisingly, first-order equations actually work best. I've tried second and third-order equations, but they tend to 
be much, the error is much more apparent on edges. And the, um, yeah, and the average tie point error actually goes down uh, when you're using higher order equations. So keeping it simple is good in this case. Um, let's see. And we can also save these equations. Uh, and then we don't need to re-rectify again. And we can quickly redo this process as it's needed in the future, uh, just straight from the raw source. And let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, this extra little term over here, the z, we actually correct. So if the higher elevation points are off in one direction, say the lower elevation points are off in the other direction, we can solve, just as easily solve the equation in three dimensions uh, with a couple extra terms and say, all right, well, we're going to solve an x and y to put it in place. But then um, just because the view angle is wrong or there's an error in the view angle or something else, um, we're going to solve in the third dimension and correct that and get a little bit of extra um, accuracy. And so finally, OSM snapping. Um, so we kind of lean on OpenStreetMap to do better than um, Landsat 8 uh, with, the, with the assumption that it is uh, accurate to say handheld, handheld GPS accuracy around five meters. Um, we pull out everything from op OpenStreetMap that we should be able to see from space, everything that's around the size of a two-lane road. Um, and we also extract lines from the satellite raster. You can see the satellite, an example satellite raster right here, and the OpenStreetMap lines on top, and they line up on the bottom. And so for each vertex in the OpenStreetMap line, I'm assuming that's kind of an interesting feature, and there's like an intersection there or a corner in the road. And so I use uh, something called mutual information to look around the raster in that area and look for the highest or the best mutual information score. And then I just actually turn those into key points, like that match into key points, and I throw it in with the rest of them. Um, and I continue with rectification like before. And so in the end, um, this ends up, this process, we've measured it to getting around uh, better than Landsat 8, so around 13 meter accuracy against, as measured against NAEP, which is pretty good. It, the process takes about anywhere from about 40 seconds to um, 10, 15 minutes, which is one to two orders of magnitude better than other um, automatic rectification engines that I found. Um, yeah, and it doesn't use much RAM. It uses, uh, see, it's the most RAM it uses is less than two gigabytes right now. Um, so. Thank you. <laughs> oh, right. And so um, we, we are active. We've actively been working on turning this from like internal experimentation, in experimentation uh, to bring it into a uh, more of an open source project. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a URL right now. It'll be on GitHub. Um, but uh, my coworkers and I are working on kind of making it independent of the other libraries uh, and making it relatively user friendly. Um, hopefully, I have time for questions. Yeah. That's, uh, so going from, uh, sure. Um, so going from SRTM, like the original global SRTM 90 meter resolution, uh, uh, he was, so he was asking if I wanna go, or if the pl there are plans to go from 90 meter SRTM to 30 meter, uh, just because that's recently been released. Uh, unfortunately, the 30 meter still has a lot of holes in it. There's no data gaps, things like that. Um, there's been a lot of time for, to clean up the 90 meter data set. And so I need, especially with the Seagar version of it, um, and so I need to go back and make sure that I've combined the data sets well, basically, um, and filled in the gaps. But it's on the list of things to do. Most of our data is Nader, um, so 
uh, ortho isn't that big of an issue. Um, and so I'm not worrying about it too much. Um, it, I, I don't know the name of the line. It's, uh, I can describe it. I'm not sure how useful that would be in this setting. Um, it's my code. Uh, I'm running a couple uh, kernels, uh, basically a, a line detection in X and a line detection in Y. That's just a, a very narrow uh, kernel. And then I'm convoluted, or then I'm uh, combining the results to turn that into a, is there a line here? Output. Do you capture the angle of the thing and put that into the, <coughs> the angle of the telescope? Uh, that, so the angle of the telescope, uh, the best we can do for that is uh, currently the 100 kilometers. Um, we can kind of go from image to image to image, but that's actually more tri tricky than it sounds just because there's uh, a lot of, the, the, there's a lot of technical details between the ground and the satellite. Yeah, yeah, but we are storing um, ang angle data and things like that. We're working on an internal telemetry as a service um, server uh, that we can start feeding all of this information back into. Do we have? Uh, you can find me after. I think that we're out of time. <laughs>